I'm Katie, I'm one of the fifth years. I've done this like kind of overview of dermatology. Um, it doesn't cover everything, it's covering the main things. I'm going to quickly glance over things that I'm sure you all know quite well. Um, so things like eczema and psoriasis, I'm just going to go through quickly and share more um, more like exam focused kind of things for that um because I'm, I'm sure that you know all of that uh i'll get started and then if anybody else joins i'll let people in okay um so sorry two seconds i'm just letting some people in okay that should be everyone for now. Okay, so I'm just gonna start off with um, describing a rash. I know in our low cast, um, sorry, OSCE last year, we had a couple of stations on describing rashes. Um, so there was one, it was um, acne, one was acne rosacea and impetigo. Um, so pretty common things, but being able to describe them and have a system to describe them does really help. Um, just having that thing to think through on the day uh, helps you get your thoughts. So it's good to start with where it is. Um, so sometimes it might not be completely, you know, it might just be like a cut section of a rash. You might not be able to comment um, on that. So if it's like, a, if it's a pigmented mole, we'll start with that, um, which is going to, like could be quite a common question and I think in your Foskies you had something like this um, so always pigmented mole go for A to E so you're looking for asymmetry so if you folded it in half it wouldn't match up if the borders irregular um, or regular it's quite round in shape if there's more than two colours in it um, that's a sign of a worrying sign of malignancy and do describe the colours because everything's worth marks and OSCEs and low casts. Um, diameter over six millimetres is worrying. Always look at the picture quite carefully because there will be um, a little, um, like a scale in the bottom of the screen usually um, that you can have a look at and it will actually tell you the, sorry, <laughs> getting distracted by the thing. Okay. Um, so if it's not a pigmented mole, you want to describe it using a scan. So it's just a mnemonic to remember it. So start with the size and the shape, um, color of it, associated changes. So have a look around it. If it's thin around it's red, um, swollen, anything like that. And then morphology. So morphology is that big list of definitions that um, you get given in CCT to read through and learn. Um, kind of something that you just have a look through the night before and make sure you're familiar with it. Um, so then distributions, you wanna say, you know, is it quite a localized area? Is it widespread, is it all over the body? And then things like flexural extensor dermatomal um, can help to point towards a diagnosis. So configuration is more like the pattern shape of it. So like annular lesions, um, discoid lesions, things like that. And then, as I said, morphologies, all your lesions. Um, just a little tip if you get an examining station. So I, at some point, I think it was just a Fosky at some point, had a MSK hand exam. Um, and it was an arthritis picture. So I checked the elbows because that's just what we're taught to do. Um, I didn't check the knees, though. And on the patient's knees, they had psoriatic plaques on both knees. So the diagnosis was uh, psoriatic arthritis. So just making sure that you check everywhere. Um, have a look at the nails as well for psoriatic signs. Um, everything can help give clues. Okay. Um, so sorry if the um, camera's in the way. You can just hopefully move it around to see all the pictures clearly. Um, I've just put up all the definitions because you guys can read through that and get familiar with them. There's no point in me listing them all out to you. But does anybody want to have a go at describing this first one? So the top left picture. 
So whether you want to unmute yourself or just put it in the chat. Sorry, it would help if I could get the chat up. Sorry, guys, two secs. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I'll just talk through this first one. I can't get the chat up, that's okay. Um, so, this first one up here, uh, I guess it's hard to tell from the picture, but it, this would be described as a uh, widespread particular rash. So, you would maybe ask the examiner, or in real life, you would press on it and see that it's non blanching. Um, so it's actually, so these tiny, tiny ones are petechiae, whereas those bigger ones are purpura. Um, so this petechial purpuric rash can commonly be seen with um, meningococcal septicemia. So that's your primary worry. That's the thing you want to exclude first off. Um, but it can quite commonly be seen in vasculitis as well. So something else that you might want to think about. Um, obviously, it depends on your type of patient as well. Um, does anybody want to have a go describing this one? And um, so this one is um, actually like an abrasion. So it's more these um this thickening of the skin markings that we're looking at in this one. Um, so if I was an exam, I would describe this as a um uh, I guess I would say it's a plaque, a uh, white plaque um seems to be on the wrist and with thickening of the skin fissures, which is in line with lichenification. Um it's most commonly seen with eczema. Um, so that's something that you consider in this patient. Um, so this one is a classical one. You could get this in exams. Um, so it's an erythematous uh, vesicular rash, which is spread along the dermatome. Um, so that description, so while you're talking through it, you would already know yourself that it's classical for uh, shingles. Um, so this would be quite a painful rash in someone and you'd want to start on um, acyclovir. And then this last one, it's not projected very well, but um, this is a widespread erythematous macular papular rash. Um, so the difference here, the macules are the more flat areas. Um, sorry, lichenification. So um, lichenification, sorry, you might see it if you, I've covered it with the camera, is just a like a thickening of the skin markings. So you can see it, um, sorry, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not on the screen, but those are like extra white bits in this thickening of the lines of the skin. Um, it's usually just due to an inflammatory reaction. It's just thickening of the epidermis of the skin. Um, so it'll just show up as like a hyperpigmented area. Um, so on Caucasian skin, this would actually sometimes look um, red. Um, so it can be quite confusing with excoriation, which is more scratch marks. Um, but you would see it as a darker area of the background colour generally. Um, and sorry, this last one. So macular papular rash, so that is most commonly seen with measles. Um, so anything macular papular. Um, as I was in the mac, are the more flat areas. And then you can see vaguely these ones. I can try and convince you that they're slightly more raised, especially down here. Um, so they're more papules. Okay. Um, so then eczema. Um, 
So I'm going to go through this quickly because I think you guys already kind of know about this. Um, just the main things to note, so it's atopic, so often associated with asthma and hay fever. Um, so ask about family history of those kind of things, ask about family history of eczema as well. It's a chronic condition, relapse and remitting, things that can trigger it, pets, allergies, um, dust, dander, stresses, all the usual things. So if you're taking a dermatology history, good to have those things to ask about as well. Um, so you can see in this one, this is quite an angry eczema, but it is more in the flexural region um, of the elbow. So you tend to see it in the elbows, backs of the knees uh, are the classical places. Does anyone know what this picture on the top right is? So it's a type of eczema. I don't know if anyone's going to have heard or maybe seen it before. Um, so this is discoid eczema. Um, so you can see that classical round shape, the discoid. This is actually the only real type of eczema that I know of that you would change your management plan a little bit. Um, so instead of the usual management, which I'll go through in a sec, you would use fusobac cream. So that's a combination of fusidic acid, which is an antibiotic, and steroid cream. So it works best for this discoid eczema rather than anything else. Um, so this one down here as well. Um, so this is a condition commonly seen in uh, peds more than adults, um, but it's eczema herpeticum. So it's an herpes simplex virus on top of the eczema. And um, this can be quite serious, can be quite widespread, and make the child quite unwell. So they generally need to be admitted and have IV acyclovir in this. Um, I guess the difference with the eczema is you can see that it's a uh, much more angry looking, these like vesicles, which is, um, vesicles are kind of in line with the herpes virus. Uh, I've done this one as well. So this is shown it in uh, black skin, which is looking completely different than what you're seeing here, obviously. That is because they're more prone uh, to hyperpigmentation. So this uh, like darkening of skin color, is due to the inflammatory reaction from the eczema. Um, so they commonly, more commonly seen like this than this usual erythematous rash that Caucasians get. Um, this can also be seen with psoriasis, this like hyperpigmentation as well. It's just any inflammatory skin reaction. Um, but in this case, that uh, rash is in the flexural region, so it's pointing towards eczema for you there. Uh, so management, uh, as with any chronic condition, you wanna educate your patient, um, tell them all about it, tell them what they need to avoid, as uh, things stop making it worse. They also need to know what to do to make it better. Uh, that is just gonna be loads and loads of emollients. So it's a good idea to be able to name a couple of emollients because in an exam, they might actually ask you um, for some examples. So these are just ones that stick with me. They need to be put on as much as possible throughout the day. Just keep lathering it on. If you're putting on a steroid cream, you'd put the steroid cream on first and then emollient on top. It's like a protective barrier then. Um, if they're having a lot of itching or anything with their eczema or there's an allergy component, antihistamines are useful. And then this little table of your topical steroids. So there's not really a hard and fast rule of which steroids to use when. Um, for something like this top left picture, that's quite a severe um, eczema flare up. It looks quite red and angry. Um, and this bottom right one as well, you can see there's like um, thickening of the skin starting to go on there, might lead to some scarring. So you'd probably use more potent um, steroids or something like a betanovate to start. Usually start on a higher, um, potency one for less amount of time than using a mild one for a long time to try and clear it. Um, and just to note as well that you can only use mild on the face, so hydrocortisone only on the face and other thin areas of the skin like genitals as well. Um, as I said before, the uh, fusidic acid cream for the discoid eczema or just eczema that looks um, infected, you can obviously get bacterial infections on top of eczema too. Um, so if it looks particularly red and angry or pussy, 
or the patient's unwell with it. Um, second line therapies, you would be referring to dermatology for these kind of things. So uh, cyclosporin, azathioprine and methotrexate. Uh, just something to note for the azathioprine as well. Um, a common exam question is what to check before starting on azathioprine. Does anybody know what you would start? So you have to check, um, everyone has this enzyme, which is called TMPT enzyme. So if they don't have the enzy enzyme, they can't break down azathioprine and it gets toxic. So everyone is checked, first of all, to see if they can metabolize it. Um, it's come up in our exams before. So just something to note. Okay, psoriasis as well, they covered it um, to death. So this is more, uh, everything with his background with these white scaly plaques on top. Uh, it's quite well demarcated as opposed to the eczema. So eczema is usually quite widespread, whereas this you can, you can see around the edges, you can map out exactly where the lesions are. Um, again, compared to eczema, it's usually on extensor surfaces. So as I said before, on the knees, always check. Um, elbows and in the scalp is the most common places. Um, also in the gluteal cleft as this bottom left photo shows is commonplace for it so check there also just aware that you can get flexural psoriasis as well so just because a rash is in the flexural area doesn't mean it's eczema unfortunately medicine's always a bit confusing uh, and guttate psoriasis is another subtype as well so this rash in the top right is guttate psoriasis so it's got that um, appearance this is actually commonly seen in kids about two weeks after a strep throat infection. They might present with this rash. Um, it actually responds best to light therapy. Uh, usually does go away. I don't think there's any increased risk of psoriasis or anything afterwards. It's just a weird uh, reaction to the strep throat infection. Um, Neil signs as well. So this bottom photo shows Neil Pitten. So you can see the like um, little dots throughout the nails. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so that's probably the most common nail sign you'll see. You can also get onchalysis, uh, which is just like lifting of the nail. And then the subungual hyperkeratosis. So it's, uh, it kind of goes alongside the onchalysis. It's just like build up of skin underneath. It gets really quite thick um, nails. Uh, it's important to note that these people are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So something that you might want to throw in, you know, if you're discussing management of psoriasis, of course, go through all your usual management options. Um, but it'd be nice to throw in at the end that you would want to do a Q-risk score in these people um, and potentially start on statins, antihypertensives or lifestyle modifications dependent on their Q risk and other cardiovascular factors. Uh, just something nice to mention in OSCEs and Lucas to show your thinking holistically. Um, also, psoriatic arthritis, as I mentioned before in a hand exam, can come up. So always check for skin changes with your MSK exams as well, looking for psoriasis, because about 10 of the people with psoriasis will actually have arthritis. It's quite a big chunk of people considering how common this is. Um, if they have nail signs as well, that is quite indicative that they might have um, arthritis going on too. Um, good to know a couple of triggers, things that make it worse, so alcohol stress, a couple of medications to note are beta blockers and lithium. Uh, local trauma gives you this Kogner phenomenon. I've never seen it in real life, but it's like, um, so say you got a point of injury like here, you'd get like a line of a psoriatic plaque coming from that, and that's your Kobner phenomenon. Uh, light generally tends to improve psoriasis, and light therapy is part of second line management, but do note that some might get worse with psoriasis, so just because it gets worse with light doesn't mean it's not psoriasis. Uh, just note as well, so psoriasis improves with light, whereas lupus which sometimes can appear quite similar to this rash you're seeing here, um, can get worse with lights. So lupus is photosensitive. Um, of course, not mutually exclusive, some gets worse, but 
is a good uh, classical exam way of differentiating the two. I don't think they'd be so mean as to mix you up. Uh, so going through treatment again, again, chronic condition, educate the patient, tell them about it, tell them their inc increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, emollients is also first line management here. And the only difference is your vitamin D analogues. So you always give a uh, vitamin D cream with your steroid cream. So this uh, calcitriol, calcitriol is Dovenex. So that's just your vitamin D cream alone. And then the vitamin D with a steroid is most commonly Dovabet. Um, cool tar is often used as well. So you can get cool tar shampoo and things like that. It's quite good for uh, psoriasis of the scalp. But it is really smelly and it stains your clothes. Patients aren't really that keen on it, but it is effective. Um, and then you've got retinoid creams, which you can use too. So then these kind of things, you're definitely going to dermatology for. So this is your UVA, UVB light therapy. So it's quite a commitment. So you need to go um, three times a week for 68 weeks for light therapy. Um, it's done in short blasts like that, obviously because of the increased risk of skin cancer as well. So it's not really a long-term solution, um, maybe more to uh, manage a flare. Uh, or as I said before, it's good for gut psoriasis. And the Sorelin is just a light sensitizer. Uh, so then you've got your oral uh, therapies, your acetretinin, um, this is a retinoid, obviously that's teratogenic, so you need to be careful in women of childbearing age, obviously contraindicated in pregnancy, but it's important to note that they cannot get pregnant for two years after taking this, so even though they've stopped it, um, you still can't get pregnant for two years, so that's something to bear in mind. And then third line, so they've got this uh, specific score, psoriasis area severity index score. So that needs to be over 10 and you need to feel two systemic meds. So this is quite a, a last resort um, line. And just be aware as well, uh, similar to the azathioprine question, sometimes they ask, do you know what do you screen for before starting a biologics? Um, so you want to screen for TB because starting a biologics can uh, cause TB to flare again. But it's just important to note that the test for this is called a quantiferon test. So that came up in one of our exams and nobody really knew what a quantiferon test actually was. Um, okay, so seborrheic dermatitis. So this in its mildest form is just standard. Uh, it's an inflammatory reaction to this fungus, uh, commonly seen scalp, eyebrows, ears, uh, nasal folds. It's a good differential for
Hi, sorry, I lost my internet. Hopefully, um, it should be okay now. I've set up a hotspot, so hopefully. Uh, sorry, if you guys missed anything, I don't think, um, I think it's, I realized when it stopped. So hopefully you've not missed anything. Um, but just shout if you think you did. Um, sorry, I'll just bring up the PowerPoint again. Okay, I think this is where we left off. Um, so Acne Vulgaris, as I said before, this was a, a picture that we got shown in our OSCE um, and we had to describe it and talk through management options for it. Really common condition, so obviously it's good to know uh, the common management for it. So it's obviously got a lot of um, pathogenesis going on, which is all very boring. But it's just important to note that there is a bacteria involved in this called P. acnes. Um, it is gram positive anaerobes, but if you swab it, it will not culture, it won't show up. So a differential for acne um, might be folliculitis. If you swab folliculitis, that will uh, culture positive, it'll be staph or is positive. So it's a good way to differentiate them, that this wouldn't culture. Um, so in black skin, it actually tends to be more inflammatory um, acne that you see. So you can see these uh, papules and pustules are much more common than blackheads and whiteheads in um, skin of color. Um, it also has a higher chance in black skin of keloid scarring. So that's just um, like the inflammatory reaction can lead to really thick, prominent scars. Uh, so it's quite important to treat this before uh, it starts scarring and get to that stage. So it's maybe worth noting that in uh, management you might be a little bit more aggressive than you would in Caucasian skin. Um, sorry if the cameras are in the way, hopefully you can see okay. So first line treatment for acne is topicals. So topical benzoyl peroxide is bog standard first line, that's what everybody's going to get. Um, it can bleach the skin a little bit. Um, especially in skin of colour, so you just want to be careful with that. Uh, it can lead to a hyperpigmentation in skin of colour. Um, in Caucasian skin, it tends to go away when you stop therapy, but for some reason in black skin, it does not. So um, it can still be used, but we just need to be cautious with it and use it correctly. Um, topical retinoids and topical antibiotic creams can be used as well. Um, second line therapy for this can also be done in GP, uh, so just a low dose oral antibiotic, you usually take it for three to four months and it's usually a tetracycline. Um, lime cycling is a good one to pick, it's only indication in the BNF is acne and it doesn't have as much of the um, rills and contraindications as the other tetracyclines. Uh, another option in females is an androgen contraceptive pill, so something like Dianet. Uh, can be useful. And then last line is something you'd be going to a dermatologist for, but it's an oral retinoid, so Roaccutane. So in psoriasis, you use acetretinoin. In acne, you use isotretinoin. Um, so whereas in with this one for psoriasis, you can't get pregnant for two years after, this one you can't get pregnant for a month after. So it's not quite as limiting. Um, you can only start this if you feel to previous antibiotics. Um, just a few things to note about these meds. These are quite common questions that you might get asked. Um, so tetracyclines, no in pregnancy and no in kids under 12. That's because it can cause yellow teeth and some weird skeletal dysplasias, so avoid. Um, and these side effects of the photosensitivity rash is really something that you want to tell your patient before taking. So you need to just make them aware to wear sun cream when they're out in the sun and cover up a little bit more because they can come out in a nasty rash. Um, and it may raise the ICP, intracranial pressure. This is more important if you're thinking about then starting in Roaccutane because Roaccutane can also cause photosensitivity and raise the ICP. So they shouldn't be used together. And in fact, the tetracycline should be stopped a month before you start your Roaccutane. Um, another big side effect of this is uh, suicidal ideation and depression. So if the patient has a 
past history of um, mental health, you might want to take that into account when you're starting on this, make them aware this can make it a bit worse and keep an eye on them. Um, another big side effect is dry lips and skin. Um, if the patient actually doesn't have dry lips while they're taking this, then they're probably, it's not effective, not an effective dose for them. So practically everybody will get really, really dry lips and skin. Um, also to note, it's teratogenic. Um, so they're all enrolled in a pregnancy prevention program in GP. Um, and they need two forms of contraception, ideally. So that would be something like the pill and condoms. Um, note the progesterone only pill on its own or condoms on its own aren't seen as effective enough for this. So they would need to be together. Um, something like the coil, I think, like that would be okay on its own because uh, it's slightly more effective. Um, they also need to take regular pregnancy tests throughout as well. So it is quite a quite a big commitment. Um, I think that's it for here. Cool. So acne rosacea was also one that came up in our OSCE. So just describing the rash. So it's just quite an erythematous rash, commonly seen um, like this malar rash that you'd see in lupus over the cheeks and nose. Uh, the thing that differentiates it in this picture is you can see on our forehead, um, you can see those papules and pustules. That's what differentiates this from the rash you see in lupus. You can see through the rash on our nose and cheeks as well, those little papules. Um, don't know if you can see it very clearly as well, but you can see on our cheeks especially, there's telangiectasia as well. So just those really prominent uh, blood vessels. Um, that's another way to differentiate it, commonly seen. We don't really know what causes this and black skin doesn't tend to be affected by it. Um, so we treat it with topical metronidazole. So that's first line. Something more severe, you're going to use an oral uh, systemic antibiotic. So oxytetracycline is what you use in this. And then advise them on high factor sun cream. This is a really photosensitive rash. Um, sunlight makes it much worse. And because the skin is so inflamed already, that's a much uh, increased risk of cancers as well. So make sure you educate them about that. And obviously this is quite a cosmetic problem as well. So referring to camouflage clinic for creams or laser therapy for the telangiectasia can be helpful in some people as well. Okay, so going through the skin cancers quickly as well. I think this came up in your guys Fosky. Uh, maybe it was the third years. Um, but they got given uh, questions, pictures of the different skin cancers, and what you do for each and differentiating each is quite common in finals. So a BCC is the most common one. Um, it's really slow growing, so your history is going to be over months. Um, this thing's going to grow. Typically, it's seen as a shiny, pearly edge. So this top left picture is a good example of that. You can see the shine, pearly. Um, with this telangiectasia on it, um, that's really commonly seen. It rarely metastasizes, as I say, it's really slow growing, so it's not a two week wait referral. Um, so it's the only one of these that's not um, an urgent, it would just be a routine outpatient appointment for dermatology to get it checked out. Um, this picture on the bottom, so sometimes it can ulcerate, uh, so that's called a rodent ulcer. Um, something like this, you might be a little more cautious about whether it is an SCC and you might two week re referral it, but generally if you're confident it's a BCC, it can just be routinely referred. Uh, this top right picture is just to show that in skin of colour, um, over 50% of BCCs are actually pigmented. So whereas you can see them here, it's kind of skin colour, really shiny, pearly, lots of them in skin of colour are actually pigmented lesions like this. Um, and this is a nodular one, so that is the most predominant subtype that they often uh, that we see in skin of colour as well. Um, so obviously this this looks completely different than here. Um, so it's maybe just best to familiarise yourself with a few pictures, although there is not a lot out there, unfortunately. But hopefully that will start to change. Um, so risk factors for this, things that you ask about in your history, um, so age, family history of BCCs, if they have a personal history of it, photo damage, so asking things like 
are they fair skin? Do they burn easily? Holidays, sun cream, do they work outside, sun veggies, all that kind of stuff. Um, and this thing called Gorlin syndrome, so this is very much a final kind of fact. Um, so Gorlin syndrome is related to this patch gene. Um, and it's just these, like you get numerous BCCs in someone of quite a young age. And they have a weird rash on their palms and soles of their feet. Um, it's like a weird pit and rash. Uh, very niche, but something to note if someone's presented with multiple BCCs. Uh, so treatment of this, you are going to excise it anyway because it can continue to grow and can uh, get quite invasive. So you're going to excise it and uh, do a diagnostic biopsy while you're at it. Check it definitely is BCC. Um, we excise it generally using this thing called Mohs micrographic surgery. So that's just you are looking down a microscope, cutting it out, and you keep uh, checking with the microscope to check you've got all the edges. So you just keep excising it, keep checking, just to make sure all of it is gone. Okay, so it's SCC is looks quite different in these pictures. Um, I couldn't actually find any pictures um, of an SCC in skin of colour, but I am pretty sure that they get this as well. Um, so if anyone can find anything, please do share because it would be helpful. Um, but SCC is the most common one, the second most common, sorry, that we see in Caucasians. So this is going to have a slightly shorter history, so more uh, like weeks to months history. Um, more commonly on sun exposed sites, this can metastasize, so it's a two week rule referral. Uh, risk factors are all the same as before, just noting um, Bowen's disease. So, this is uh, this top picture. It's like these uh, red scaly plaques, uh, commonly seen on the legs actually, um, and Bowen's disease is a precancerous. So it's like an SCC in situ, so it would be something to look out for. Um, immunosuppressed patients also generally tend to um, be more affected by SCCs than other cancers, so patients on biologics especially, something to note. Um, and then solar keratocytes, I've got a picture of that later on, um, but that can progress to SCC as well. Um, so all the same things apply, but this is slightly more um, aggressive, so it's two week rate. You might also get radiotherapy and with all cancers, it's always discussed in MDT. Okay, so melanoma as well. So this is just uncontrolled growth of the melanocytes. So it can come from normal skin or it can come from somewhere there was a previous mole. As I mentioned back at the start, always describing it using A, B, C, D, E. So once you see this, that's what you're going through in your head. Um, quite a few different types. Uh, superficial spreading, like this one is the most common you'll see. Um, in this one, you can see the nodular. So that's uh, that type. In um, skin of colour, the, actually the most common subtypes are this subungual melanoma. So they're actually more commonly on non-sun exposed sites in skin of colour. So those are paler areas like um, palms of your hands, soles of your feet. So that's your acral lenticinosis, sole of the foot one. Um, really commonly misdiagnosed for um, foot warts or something like that. Uh, so it's really, it's often diagnosed quite late um, in skin of color, which is sad, but hopefully we'll get more aware of that. Um, and subungual as well. So as you can see, uh, you can see it arrowed in this picture and then in the, you can see it down in the nail bed. So that's um, called Hutchinson sign. So that's the pegmentation starts proximally in the nail, so it starts in the nail bed, which is Hutchinson's sign, and that is a sign of malignancy over trauma or any other kind of diagnosis going on. Okay, so just a few quick ones. So seborrheic keratosis, really, really common, especially in people um, over 60. You see all this over people's backs all the time. It's got this like warty, stuck on appearance is what's often described as completely idiopathic, um, benign, not going to progress to cancer at any stage, but can catch on things, get a bit annoying. So you can cryotherapy it, but most often we just use Vaseline moisturise. Uh, so this is the solar keratosis that I was talking about. So these two have quite similar names, um, but 
the most important difference is this can progress to an SCC. So this is a sign of chronic sun damage. It's those like yellow flaky appearances, most commonly seen on the scalp, sun exposed areas. Uh, so treatment for this is liquid nitrogen and this uh, Effidex cream, which can cause the skin to go quite red, um, but that's normal in that treatment. Uh, pyogenic granuloma. So this is a vascular tumour that grows at uh, a site of trauma. It's not malignant, it's completely benign, but it can grow quite like quickly, it can bleed, so you would still excise it. Um, dermatofibroma can be a differential for a BCC, a PUSH. Um, it's just a sign of site of minor trauma, so somewhere like an insect bite or something, the fibroblasts have proliferated and you get this little pink papule. Um, feels quite firm to touch and characteristically, if you pinch it, the middle of it will dimple. So that's how you know that it's a dermatofibroma. Um, quickly on infection, so cellulitis is staph aureus, um, most commonly unilateral. So hot, red, swollen, tender, they can be quite unwell with it as well. Um, important to note that chronic swelling can predispose, predispose so heart failure. Um, quite commonly, you'll see cellulitis on top of that. Um, treatment is with flu clocks. Uh, just with your examining a leg, always compare them because you can see in skin of colour. If you just looked at this on its own, it might be slightly hard to say, yeah, definitely that's cellulitis compared to the picture above. Um, but comparing it to the other leg, you can quite clearly see that it is predominantly different. So make sure that you're always examining both legs together and looking for that difference. Um, erysipelas is like a more superficial version of cellulitis. Um, so it's more a well demarcated rash. So you can see in the legs, the edges aren't very well defined. Whereas on this one on the face, they are very well defined. Slightly raised edges. Um, this is actually due to group A strep. So your treatment is slightly different with uh, clindamycin or erythromycin rather than flu clox in that one. And then impetigo, so that is your classical golden honey coloured crusts. It's a staph infection, so you're treating it with uh, fusidic acid. If it's localised, like the bottom picture, that would probably be a fusidic acid. Um, if it's more widespread, uh, you would then give oral flu clocks. Uh, just giving advice to the family as well that it's really contagious, so don't share towels, toys, anything like that. And they need to stay off school until all the lesions are crusted over or 48 hours after starting antibiotics. Uh, so we talked about shingles a little bit earlier, so often affects the trigeminal nerve as well. Uh, so you can see it on the face in the top right picture. A uh, sign to note is if you get the vesicles on the tip of your nose, that is also Hutchinson sign, like the nail one as well. Um, but if you get vesicles on the tip of your nose, it's really likely that you're gonna get ophthalmic shingles um, so that needs to be referred to ophthalmology urgently because that can be quite serious. Um, and then there's Ramsey Hunt syndrome as well. So if someone presents with a facial nerve palsy, obviously you want to rule out stroke and Bell's palsy, but check the ears as well because if they have uh, vesicles around the ears, it could be uh, Ramsey Hunt syndrome. So it's just the area that's affected. Uh, so common treatment, just oral acyclovir and the people can now get the shingles vaccine. It's a one-off vaccine and it's 70 years plus. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through these quickly. I don't, if you guys wanna put in the chat what you think each one is. Um, so this top left one, does anybody know what that is or what it's a sign of? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So this is acanthosis nigricans, um, which is commonly associated with insulin resistance. So you can see it in diabetes, correct? So type 2 diabetes. So um, you can also see it in polycystic ovaries and obesity as well. So generalized sign of insulin resistance. So what about the one below it? So bottom left one, that's the inside of someone's lip. So if you know what it is, what it might be due to.
This one is a little bit harder. Oh, interesting. Um, that is a really good guess. I think it could um, present like this, so Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, this is actually um, just buccal hyperpigmentation. So these are um, like just hyperpigmented spots. Um, in Caucasian people, you might see it all over the skin. You might see them looking a bit more tanned. Um, but in people of colour, you gen generally tend to see it um, inside of the gums, around the teeth, and palms and soles as well. Um, so this is a sign of Addison's disease. Um, it's due to the increased ACTH being produced, which uh, stimulates the melanocytes. So you can get this weird hyperpigmentation. So in Caucasian people, it might just look like they've been on holidays. Um, what about this middle one? So this person's elbow. Do you guys know what it is, what it might be due to? This is something I didn't really come across until finals. Um, so it's really quite a common one, but not really often talked about. I don't think I would have known this one either, but this one is um, dermatitis herpetiformis. Um, I'll send the PowerPoint on my notes so I don't worry about spelling things. Um, but it's just these really itchy, like papules around the elbow. This is a sign of underlying celiac disease. So this is when they eat gluten, they can come out in this rash on their elbows. So you might get someone uh, presenting with just this itchy rash, um, check for celiac disease. And that's treated with Dapsone cream. And um, what about the one beside it? So these red lesions on the legs. So there's quite a few causes for this, if you can name any. Yeah, right, that's right. So it's erythromyelitism. Can you think of any causes? There's quite a few and it's quite a common question. Yeah, perfect. So IBD, sarcoidosis can just be idiopathic as well. Um, so IBD is probably one of the most common, but also strep throat. Um, so ask if they've had a sore throat recently, they can come out in this. Um, also, the oral contraceptive pill can do it too, so worth taking a medication history. And then this one on the right hand, anybody know what that is? So you've got this like a uh, darker ring and then a slightly lighter one and then darker one again. So it's a three ringed lesion. Yeah, perfect. So erythema multiforme. Um, anyone know what the most common cause is? Yeah, clever. Well, mycoplasma isn't the most common, but mycoplasma pneumonia can cause it. And it's quite a top exam question. So a young person presenting with uh, fatigue, fevers, weird signs can be this atypical pneumonia. But most commonly, it's actually caused by herpes simplex virus. OK, one more slide. <laughs> so this top left one. So quite a classic rash over the nose and cheeks. Does anyone know what it is? It's not the one we talked about earlier. Very sensitive to light. Yeah, lupus. Yeah, so this is the typical malar rash that you get lupus. So you can see it completely spares the nasolabial folds. So it's a good, um, differential marking in this one and sensitive to light of course. Um, the one below it is discoid lupus. So Afro-Caribbeans are actually far more common, um, commonly affected by lupus than Caucasians, but they actually there's no photos online of it. There's no photos of this malar rash in it, um, whereas they are much more affected by it. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, they actually more commonly get this discoid rash though. Uh, so it could be a differential for psoriasis, so you can see how that could get confused with uh, like a white plaque of psoriasis as well. So just bearing that in mind. Uh, what about this middle top one? Anybody know what it is? Yeah, bit of LIGO. So this is just an autoimmune process, uh, destruction of melanocytes. 
And um, because it's autoimmune, you want to think of other things as well. So thinking about Addison's, thinking about celiac disease, um, connective tissue disorders, things like that. Okay, what about the one below that on the legs? Got a bit of a strange name. I'll be very impressed if anyone gets it. Yeah, nice one. So levido reticularis. Um, so this can be, you know, this can your legs can just look mottled when you're cold, which is completely normal. But when it's more long-standing, you're uh, thinking of levido reticularis. Um, quite commonly seen with antiphospholipid syndrome. So you want to rule that out. So you'd also be seeing uh, recurrent clots in those kind of people and recurrent miscarriages in females. Um, top one, top right. Yeah, so this is Raynaud's phenomenon. So it can be idiopathic and no cause known for it. But it's just important to note that the couple of connective tissue disorders are linked to it as well. And drugs, especially beta blockers, can cause this. Um, so treatment is with a calcium channel blocker called nifidipine and just keeping your hands warm. And then one below it, a little bit rogue, it's not psoriasis. Yeah, Gottron's papules. So this is a sign of dermatomyositis. Um, so it can be an underlying malignancy in these people, um, most commonly lung, pancreatic, um, bile or ovarian. Uh, so just worth knowing that if you see this, you need to check for underlying um, things as well. Okay, so just a little tip. This book um, that I've put a link to here, I can give you the link um, on another source as well if it's easier. It's really, really helpful. And usually um, they post it to you completely free of the not at the minute, unfortunately, because of Corona. But um, they have it online to access completely free. So it might be worth having a look at that. That's what I use for dermatology. It's really thin, it's quite quick. Lots of pictures, it's very good. Um, I do have a little quiz. If I understand, I've been talking for quite a while now. So if you want to leave, that is absolutely fine. Please just fill in the survey before you go or open the survey. Um, if you do want to do the quiz, stick around. Um, I'll just get it up for you guys now. I will hang about for a bit afterwards if um, anyone has any questions as well. Okay. Um, let me find it. Okay, so it's on Kahoot. So if you have a phone or anything nearby, then. I've never used this before, so I hope it works. Okay. Um, so I'll just give you a minute to get online, enter the pin. It's quite short, it's only um, 12 questions, so it's just to go through. A couple of points. And then I'll hang around for some questions. Afterwards, so we're ready. Oh, okay. I'll oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Okay, cool. Let's go. I think everyone's answered. So this is eczema. Um, 
So yeah, of course, um, you want to give them more and patient education, but it's quite angry, it's quite red looking. You want to start on a topical steroid just to get that um, information down. Um, and then long-term management after that is your emollient. Um, so just obviously if it is quite mild on the hand, um, you might not need topical steroid, but when it's quite red and angry like that, yeah. And you can see actually here this uh, like uh, extenuation and skin markings. So that's lichenification and the excoriation going on as well. So that is quite severe. It's going to need a topical steroid. Cool. Okay, so a well eight-year-old child's coming to GP. He's had a sore throat recently and he comes in with this rash. What is it? Well, you guys are very speedy. So this is gutted psoriasis. So it's that raindrop appearance. Um, it's just little dots everywhere. Um, as I said, it's completely fine. You don't need full psoriasis management. It responds really well to light therapy though, which can be a good way of getting rid of it quick. Okay, so which of these best describes psoriasis? So describing the rash of psoriasis, which one do you think is best? Yeah, you're all kneeling it. Yeah, so it's usually quite red background and white skilly plaques is classic and obviously extensor surface is classic as well. Um, whereas the flexor is more, yeah, that was the other one, sorry. Catching you guys out. Flexor surfaces is more eczema than psoriasis, although it can still be psoriasis. Sorry, that was a bit mean actually. <laughs> Okay, so sorry if you guys maybe don't know this already. So which of them is the most potent steroid cream? So I always get confused between two of these. Yeah, perfect. So I always get confused between clobetazole and clobetazone. And I still haven't thought of a way to remember it. So if anyone does have a way, please share. Um, but it's useful just knowing that little table and being able to name at least one from each level of potency. Okay, so what's the first line management for this? Yeah, topical benzyl peroxide, perfect. So even though it is uh, black skin and this can lead to hyperpigmentation and scarring, it still can be used. Um, just being a little bit more cautious with it. Perfect. Okay, so while you're taking Roaccutane, isotretinoin, this is the one for acne vulgaris. What do we need? Yeah, well done. So yes, you need two forms of contraception. That's right. Um, you also need regular bloods. Sorry, I technically didn't mention that. It can cause um, hyperlipidemia. Uh, so it can, you do um, LFTs and liver, lipids before, and I think three months and 12 months into therapy um, and a full blood count. Um, but the most important thing to note is two forms of contraception ideally and pregnancy tests. Okay, first line management again. It is what's going to be most common. Yeah, nailed it. So topical metronidazole. So again, not something I knew before finals, but uh, that, that rash was acne rosacea. 
Um, so topical metronidazole is what you're using. Um, if it was more severe, then you would use your oral antibiotic, which was oxytetracycline for rosacea. Um, fusidic acid is um, antibiotic cream as well, but not used in this one. And it's not a staph infection, so not flute pox. Okay, so what's the most likely diagnosis? So this is one of the signs that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, well done. So yeah, trauma is really common. Um, infective endocarditis, not that common. Um, probably, like if you see that in a nail, it is probably more commonly trauma, but it's that Hutchinson sign. So it's starting really proximal on the nail, starting in the nail bed, more likely to be malignant. Okay, so which one is true? So the rest, three are false, one is true. Yeah, well done. So that was uh, separate keratosis. So it's those warty, stuck on looking in, um, lesions, not at increased risk for cancer, completely benign, um, not a sign of sun damage at all. It's just really common in older people. Um, so no treatments required. Can use cryotherapy to get them off um, or Vaseline, something to moisturize them because they can't get stuck on clothes, which is good. Okay, so how long are we keeping this child off from school? If at all. Perfect. So this is in Patago. It's quite a severe one. Um, still quite localized. So you could probably still use fusidic acid um, unless the child was unwell. Um, so yeah, keeping them off until all the lesions are crusted or 48 hours after antibiotics. Um, just make sure that you tell them about um, that it's really contagious as well. So in the household, not sharing towels and things like that. Okay, so what is this a sign of? Yeah, well done. So this was acanthosis necrocans. Um, so you can just see this like velvety dark skin markings. Um, it's really commonly seen in the armpits and round the neck as well. Um, some people can think it's just sun exposure, but it is a sign of insulin resistance. So as I said before, seen in diabetes, uh, polycystic ovaries and obesity as well can cause insulin resistance. Okay, last one. So which one of these do you need to refer urgently for two week wait? Sorry if they're a little small, hopefully you can see. Yeah, well done. So this was, so top left one was a dermatofibroma. So this is the one can happen just after minor trauma, an insect bite, pinch it, dimples in the center. One below it's a BCC. So you can see the pearly shiny edge. That's just a routine outpatient. Uh, this one was solar keratosis. That's your, um, can progress to an SCC, but you treat it um, in GP. And then this one looks quite nasty, asymmetrical, irregular border, got a nodular region, got different colours, two week wait. Um, just be careful guys, know that you always um, 
say that you're going to do a two week wait. So make sure that you get that in there. It's not enough to say urgent referral. Um, you need to actually say the words two week wait and explain to your patient why you're referring them so urgently. Okay. Um, sorry if that was a little quick. It was a lot to cover. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm going to stick around for a little bit. Please, please, if you could fill in the survey. Um, sorry about my loss of internet connection. Bit rubbish, but hopefully you all still got to see everything. <laughs>